All right, so today we're going to start Chapter 5's coverage of stereochemistry. In typical me fashion, I'd like to begin by sharing a wonderful story with you. My wife, many years ago, worked as a customer service supervisor for a large manufacturer of exercise equipment. One of the employees who worked under her supervision also had a separate and additional job working at a relay center for mail that was being sent to the IRS. One day she received an envelope that contained somebody's taxes, which presumably were filled out correctly. It was her job, of course, to relay them into the proper file folder so that it got sent to the proper IRS tax center. The weird thing about this particular envelope is that this specific individual was apparently disgruntled enough with the IRS for whatever reason that he decided to urinate into the envelope prior to sending it. This poor lady working at the mail center sadly had to forward that damp and disgusting envelope onto the IRS center to which it was destined. As horrible as that story really is, there's part of me that just can't help but laugh. Because although I would never do that, I can understand on some level some people feeling disgruntled toward the bureaucratic, nonsensical organization that is the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> After today's lecture, you guys should be able to explain why stereochemistry, which is a fancy word for molecules' three-dimensional shapes, is relevant to living systems. Identify stereocenters in molecules. Determine if a given stereocenter is R or S. Explain what chirality is and determine if a given mixture is chiral. Explain what a racemic mixture is. And determine if two molecules are enantiomers, diastereomers, or the same compound. So what is an enantiomer? Well, in order to address this question, I want you guys to imagine that you have a molecule that looks something like this. That is, a molecule that has a carbon atom in it somewhere that has four separate appendages or substituents attached to that carbon atom. Each of those four appendages or substituents has to be something different. In other words, none of these four things can be the exact same. I have simplified this from my imagination by drawing it, as we see here, with each of the appendages numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now I want you to imagine that you have another molecule that looks almost exactly the same, except it's the mirror image of the molecule shown here to the left. However, it's very important for us to note that the molecule on the right is actually the mirror image of the molecule to the left. So the question is, are these two molecules the same or different? I'm not going to answer that now, but we will momentarily. Now, one thing I want you to know is that an atom, such as these carbon atoms shown in these two molecules, that's bonded to four different things in a tetrahedral geometry, is called a stereocenter. And sometimes also called a chiral center, a chirality center, or an asymmetric center. Now, the mirror image isomer of molecule A is actually different because it can't be superimposed onto molecule A. Now, you might not believe me here. I think that the clearest way for you to see it, however, is if you were to actually build a three-dimensional model using a molecular model kit. For students taking this class from me, I let you bring model kits into the exams and use them on your problem sets and homework. If you're a really cheap person like me, you can just use marshmallows and toothpicks to assemble molecular models as well. The beautiful thing about it is after you're done, you can eat them. <laughs> so once again, I want you to understand, the molecule on the left and the molecule on the right are three-dimensionally different. And the reason is because there's no way that you could take the molecule on the right and rearrange it in space so that each of its individual substituents, one, two, three, and four, were pointing in the exact same three-dimensional direction as those in the molecule to the left. Once again, this becomes much clearer if you actually build a three-dimensional model yourself. Now this circumstance in which I have one molecule that's the mirror image of another molecule, but not superimposable, is very similar to what we see when we look at our hands. If you'll notice, comparing your right hand to your left hand, you'll see that they are more or less mirror images of each other. You'll also see that there's no way, as you turn your right hand upside down and put it on top of your left hand, for you to line up each of your individual fingers in such a way that every single one of them points in the exact same three-dimensional direction. 
although being structurally mere images of each other, cannot be superimposed on each other, and therefore are not the same. Now, in the world of chemistry, we have a name for this. Non-superimposable mirror image molecules are called enantiomers, which are typified by this drawing. Once again, you can imagine three-dimensionally a molecule like this one shown on the left, staring at its mirror image counterpart shown here to the right. I'm telling you, these two molecules, if you take the one on the right and flipped it over upside down and tried to line up all of the colored balls onto the molecule on the left, you'd see that there's no way to get each of those colors pointing in the exact same three-dimensional direction. Reason is because each of these molecules has an atom in the middle of it that has a tetrahedral geometry around it and is bonded to four different things at the end of each one of those bonds. So that begs the question, look at these two molecules here. Are they really different or are they the same? Well, if you look at them closely, you'll notice that they do indeed have a tetrahedral center, this carbon center in each. You'll also notice if you look at it closely that the tetrahedral centers in these molecules are indeed bonded to four different substituents. Let's look at this one to the left, for example. This carbon, having a tetrahedral geometry around it, is bonded to a hydrogen in one direction, a nitrogen in another direction, a carbon in another direction, and a different kind of carbon in another direction. Now, occasionally, new students are tempted to think that this carbon and this carbon are both the same because they're both carbons. From a three-dimensional standpoint, that is not true. This carbon down here is a CH2, and this carbon over here is a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen on one side and single bonded to a nitrogen on the other side. Thus, they are two different kinds of carbons and therefore are structurally different. So indeed, this carbon is a tetrahedral center that is bonded to four different substituents. Analogously, this carbon over here is as well. So are these two molecules three-dimensionally different? Well, as you can see, the only real difference between them are these bonds here. The carbon-nitrogen bond at the molecule on the left is dashed, and the carbon-hydrogen bond here is wedged, and then they are opposite in the molecule on the right. Does that make them different? Well, Three-dimensionally speaking, keeping in mind that these dashed bonds mean that this appendage is going into the plane of the screen, and this wedged bond means that this hydrogen is coming three-dimensionally out of the plane of the screen. These two molecules are indeed three-dimensionally different. I can prove that to you by looking at them in an alternative manner. I've redrawn the molecule shown up here to the left so that we can see it again. Now I want you to imagine that I have the ability to reach my hand underneath this molecule shown here to the right and flip it upside down. Now, if this were flipped upside down, I hope you can see that it would look like this. You'll note that if I flip it upside down, the bond from the carbon to this nitrogen, which is pointing out of the plane of the screen, if I flip the molecule upside down, would now be pointing into the plane of the screen. And the carbon-hydrogen bond, which is pointing into the plane of the screen, would actually be pointing three-dimensionally out of the plane of the screen. If you have difficulty seeing that, you're welcome to build a model. Now you'll notice, comparing the molecule to the left with the molecule to the right, that these two molecules are indeed mirror images of each other. Because each of them has a carbon with a tetrahedral geometry around it, bonded to four different substituents. These are two non-superimposable mirror image molecules of each other. Indeed, they are enantiomers. Now why in the world of all the molecules I could conceive of would I have picked these odd looking structures to show you? The reason is because these particular molecules actually have a name and a story. Say hello to thalidomide. Hello. Now the enantiomer shown at the left is called S-thalidomide and the enantiomer shown to the right is called R-thalidomide. You'll notice as I've written here that S-thalidomide causes birth defects while R-thalidomide relieves morning sickness in pregnant women. Do you see any problems with those properties? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. So as it turns out, thalidomide was sold in Europe from 1957 to 1961 to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. Sadly, it was sold and used as a 50-50 mixture of both S and R enantiomers. 
Now that type of mixture is called a racemic mixture. Now as a result, many babies were born with birth defects, and the birth defect caused by S. thalidomide is malformed limbs. So the question is, does the three-dimensional shape of a molecule actually matter when the molecule is being used as a medicine? Well, of course, the answer is yes. You might wonder why. As it turns out, most enzymes in all living things, including people, discriminate between an antimers. The reason is because most enzymes have very specific three-dimensional shapes. Thus, one enantiomer might react with one enzyme in one way, while the opposite enantiomer will react in a completely different way. This is why when we have medicines that possess stereocenters, it is often crucial for us to assemble them in a way that only gives us one enantiomer and not the other. Now, as sad as this story is, there is sort of a silver lining to it. During the time that thalidomide was being used as a medicine in Europe and in northern Africa, an American pharmacologist and FDA official named Francis Kelsey refused to give FDA approval for the drug in the United States until further research had been done. Because of that, thalidomide distribution in the United States was limited, and as a result, there were very few thalidomide-induced birth defects here. In 1962, Francis Kelsey received the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service for blocking approval of thalidomide. This is a photograph of her receiving that award from President John F. Kennedy. This is a classic example of one of the major reasons why an FDA is important. Having an FDA with all of its contingent screening requirements for developing medicines helps to ensure that the medicines that we use and buy in the United States have limited and known side effects. Now, of course, the FDA screening process isn't perfect, but it does do an excellent job of helping prevent disasters like this one from thalidomide. The flip side of it, of course, is that drug approval in the United States often takes much longer than it does in some other countries, and the drugs end up being very much more expensive because drug companies are trying to recoup the costs that they've invested going through the 10 years and usually one billion dollars of research investment in order to get a drug approved. So do we like the FDA or not? I personally do, but I'll let you decide how you want to feel about it.